Haha, <laughs> YouTube. Let me pull that up. Uh, one up over here. Yeah, I was going to keep the Twitch stream open on my uh, tablet. Okay, there it is. Oh, YouTube. Sorry. Pardon me for a second. While I switch over to get software, go to my channel, go to my videos. I should be live now in this list, but I see myself. We'll have to find my we'll find it. It's like a it's like a mystery mystery channel. Where am I? Where am I? I don't think I'm under my other account. I'm not under Marlon Firmware, that's for sure. My channel. Videos. Yeah, nothing new there. Okay, strange. Sorry for this. Doing them a thing here. Doing them a thing. And I know I'm not Marlon Firm. Oh. Hey, man. I probably just in delay or something. Delay. Hello. Let's go to manage videos. Live, please. What? Do it in uh, on the desktop. It says I'm streaming. I don't know where I'm streaming to. Come here. Go to my channel as me and my videos. Not there. Switch to this one. I got 667 subs. Interesting. Video manager, please. YouTube studio, please. Right. Content. Live. There I am. I'm live. Oh, you know what? It's private. All right. I'm going to make this thing public. Damn. Publish, please. What's going on? There we go. Have a link. Let's go to uh, go to Twitch or OBS, and we'll send a we'll send a tweet from OBS. I mean, from Stream Deck. Let's try that. Tweet. Um, let's go to my live page here. I have some interesting. Um, right, Marlon Dev hanging out, etc. Um, that there. Hold on. Sorry, it's this. Uh, this is my setup. I haven't done this in a while. It's been a while. So that I, I'll be, you'll be able to see me and my screen all, all together, working together, very soon. Um, but yeah, just get this going here. Okay, details, details. Have the stream link. Okay, oh, I know I was going to use Stream Deck. Do that. Copy that. And we'll put this in here. Uh, live stream tweet Boop. there on that um, and I'll make one for YouTube are you live streaming over at YouTube for a while I don't know why it's in 
gray, but okay. And then the yeah, there's the link. And I think I'll just go straight to Twitter and tweet it. Tweet it on Twitter. And I'll post the same thing somewhere else too. Oh, look at my notifications. Look out, 20 of them. Boop. Recent tweet. Gina. Gina's doing well. Keep worrying she's gonna quit and we're really stuck with an octo print in limbo. Don't quit, Gina. I know it's like uh, you deserve to you deserve a retirement honestly you work so hard don't we all God. Um, let's see up oh, github keeps giving her presents I'm jealous <laughs> how do I get in good with github I brought them some I mean they get I, I bring some donations in and they take a little of that right She's very participatory. Participatory. There I am. Okay, there's my live. Okay, now this way I can hopefully keep up with keep up with the stream. Uh, okay, I want to be able to see the chat. Ah, there we are. Welcome! Exclamation point. Ah, oh, there I am. Yeah, I'm doing it as Thinky Head Software today rather than Marlin firmware, even though we're talking about Marlin firmware. Um, I want to kind of reserve that channel for th maybe not necessarily live streams, but, um, you know, not keeping live streams off. But if I do a live stream that's about Marlin topic uh, specifically, I'll, you know, jump on that. Today, who knows, I might be doing many things, many things. It's Saturday, after all. I am waiting on some testing, so there's not much I can do. Uh, as far as publishing these releases, but I've been doing as much as I can to get them ready, be ready to jump. Yeah, that's what you do. Um, uh, Michigan. Oh, I guess I could do a Q&A in Michigan. Summer course. Q&A with students. Yeah, I could do a Q&A with students. That would be fun. Try not to be too asleep uh, for that. Today I'm just like uh, I got. I woke up at like three or no, not three. I closed at first. I woke up at noon, <laughs> and then I was like, ah, it's not. I, I got till two before my live stream on Twitch, so I'm just gonna crash out. Yeah, so I slept for another couple hours, and then I woke up. I was like, oh, it's closer to three now. Oops. So yeah, I got up on uh, got up on the wrong, the right side of the bed, but you know, well rested, but late, late. I was up late because I had too much caffeine. So today I'm having a very small coffee, and I'm gonna stop drinking this pretty soon. Good stuff. Um, so anywho, constantly rework, trying to rework the how is what's going on. But let's take a quick look at um, today's mess uh, and see what's going on. Pull request page one. Yeah, so that's just me. Hopefully everyone's taking the weekend off, enjoying themselves. Uh, I'm enjoying myself. Uh, let's see, fix USB power loss recovery check. This one where it seems worth looking at. I know it's, I think, just one of those tricky ones. Um, tested on MKS Nano. Okay, free check. Uh, yeah, I always wanted to make sure on this one that, um, yeah, if you insert the, uh, basically, if you have a power loss recovery setup situation, let's say your machine goes down, power goes out, print is wasted, uh, you know, and uh, 
uh, you decide you don't want to continue to print, uh, so you take the SD card out or whatever, uh, and you know you take the wasted Getty mess off your bed or whatever you're going to do, um, and uh, and then uh, later you you get your power back and you turn on the printer and it says, do you want to continue your print? Um, you would, of course, you would say no. But you know, if you've got if you've got the SD card out and you've moved around, and a week later you decide to put it in uh, while you're in the you know switching the SD cards around, you would you want to have, say, do you want to continue the print when you just happen to insert it from some random pile of SD or whatever? Yeah. So it's one of the things you just don't want the firmware to do is anytime it sees this file, say, hey, do you want to restart it? Because it should only be when it's already in when it's in the printer at at boot time, and that's it. Even though that's you know hard to determine whether that that was today or a week ago, still it's the most likely scenario and the most safe scenario. So yeah, but that means you have to wait for the uh, the card to be ready, and so that's been a persistent thing. You have to wait for it to be ready, and then you can check for the file. So simple thing. Uh, so you've got this whole bit of logic that tries to wait for the right state to occur and have it be. If is it the first time? mount on on boot you know or have I tried to mount before and there was nothing there so therefore carry on so that's the thing is if the first time it tests and there's nothing there if it's a really nothing there that makes sense but if it's just the card acting up and not initializing quickly enough or the hardware isn't responding or something then you know you don't want to necessarily say okay that counts as a check you want to check again later. So, you know, you want to be able to distinguish between successful check that was, oh yeah, definitely definitely no card there. You confirmed a thousand times there's no card there. Um, or is there, you know, so basically you would do a check if there's definitely, if there's no card there, if it's first time, do a really, you know, persistent attempt to mount and then only fail if that really fails. That would be a good way to deal with that. So that's kind of one way I would think to do it. But this particular pull request does some things with the logic that I'm not sure about, and it causes, uh, yeah. So there is a, a check here, which has been added. And it's been 17 days since I've had a chance to respond to this one. I just keep looking at the top of the pile. <laughs> Sorry, it's whatever is the latest. It seems to get my attention, but I just want to like keep things from piling up when I can. Um, so yeah, this here, in this case, uh, if it has USB flash drive, we get media boot MS. Uh, so yeah, it's using an, a millisecond system instead. And only if it's after, after five seconds, it says, okay, I give up. Eh, that's a way to do it. That's a way to do it. After five seconds, I give up. Uh, interesting concept. Let's tweak it because I've got to tweak. Let me. Uh, what are we looking at? This one. So first things first. I guess we'll just close this up. Submit a couple of times if has USB flash drive. Right, so it initializes as Millis, which the thing is, this is at right at, ru at the beginning of runtime, like before anything happens, before setup. It happens this will be set to millis which we don't necessarily want um, what we'd rather do is have it be something like zero and then fill it in later so for example USB waiting time like here I would say if media boot MS at all, then do this logic. Um, 
and then you do something like this. You say zero. It's going to be anyway. And something to the effect of uh, come down here. If you boot uh, ms uh, zero, then uh, what? I don't want to necessarily say media boot ms uh, equals millis all the time because sometimes we want it to be zero for a reason. So I'm going to have to go with one. I know that's weird, but <clears throat> it's highly unlikely that it'll be one. But I could do this and that makes sure that it's, you know, that, that it's at least two. I guess, right? Sure, why not? Let's do this. Um, you can't make it const. If you're planning to change it. Dude, or it, yeah, and right, right. I see what you're trying to do there. You're basically saying, when did it boot? When did the when did the board boot? What was the millies at that time? It's interesting. And then you know, are, are we good five seconds after that point? I mean, it's less complicated. See why you would go there. So I'm inclined to do this. Uh, right, and again, it should be something like well, yeah, equals millis. I don't know. It never changes. Is that the idea? I mean, frankly, it doesn't matter. I mean, it should if that's what you want, it's going to boot at, you know, millis is going to start at zero and it's going to just keep counting. So why use media boot at all? Why not just say, you know, Millie's itself? Minus media boot, yeah, so. Is that short enough I can do that? Hmm. Let's see if this extra extra logic and extra four bytes that is always allocated uh, in RAM and never used again, never available to other uses, is uh, worth it for every user that has a USB flash drive. Let's see. Um, I guess it is USB. If you've got a USB flash drive, you probably have a slightly fancier board, right? You changed. Oh, yeah, I just remembered. Got rid of that, so it's not even necessary. You just look at MS itself, you know. Um, So 
guys got this in concept of an initial media check, blah, blah, blah. Um, So if your mount happens in the first five seconds, then it's considered to be fine. That's interesting. All right, see, so yeah, I tweaked it. So now that now it is doing many things that are different. Uh, boy, so many changes just for this one thing. Uh, so I could call it prevstat just to be simplify what the differences are. I could call it old stat instead of was present to make it easier to see. I know. Do this first and then come back to see um it's the only reason i'm doing that right yeah sure sure now buzzle up let's see um then we have stat equals whatever stat equals then i get uh, what else did i rename oh yeah old stat was present now Is present is called uh, stat, I guess. That we do. Uh, just keep it neat. Media stat emitted. Right, so this is the new variable that's been added. Um, it's called media stat emitted. That's pretty much the only difference that really matters here. Um, Old stat still has the two value though. It does it, yeah, it still has two. Um, so that's interesting. And I see here it's not equal to two. I feel like that should be, uh, doesn't equal two. Okay, it's the true-false one. Uh, 
Right, so this was a case where the previous stat equals two was what we had there. Now it uses media stat emitted instead. So basically it says if this was a, uh, if this point was reached before, then return, otherwise continue. Uh, it needs to do this stuff. So it could say if not media stat emitted, do the rest of this stuff. But this just makes it Less, uh, you know, less deep. Less deep, man. So much less deep. Why are we streaming today? Well, because it's Saturday. That's what we do on Saturday. We stream. That's how we do. See, my, uh, my live chat is not appearing here, though. It's interesting. Once a broadcast has been created, your live chat will appear. Oh, it yes, says private aren't supported. Well, I, it was private, and then I made it public, so it should be good now, right? Should be. Looks like it is. Yeah. It's all looking good to me. So, what's going on? Let's see. Yeah, taking a look at this real quick. I see that some of the things that happened there is, uh, yeah, these all got moved over by a bunch. Yes. Ten, ten whole characters. Let's see how that looks. A little uh, comparison there. Do that. No harm, no foul. Right, so here you can see not much changed. Uh, for real, preview stat is still two. But it doesn't mean anything anymore. Only me, only old, only uh, old stat. Yeah, only the uh, Again, media stat knitted like if um, previously old stat had been. Did I do anything with old stat? What's going on with old stat? Um. Oh, okay. Yeah. Now here it's interesting. You got this deal where it's like um, exit when the boot time waiting wait time expires. Um, media stat and then it is already set to true. No, it's not. It was, um, well, it is here, yeah, sure, but I mean, that doesn't matter, it could happen at any point. What I'm curious about is, what does this mean? Let's see, let's take a look at the logic. Always fun to use logic. All right, so the logic here is, on first mount, we want to do power loss recovery check. 
that's what this is about, essentially. Um, <clears throat> so if more than five seconds has passed since boot time, we just ignore. Still call it a first mount, though. Um, I mean, I do. Essentially, that's what that's about. Um, So again, this previous stat being equal to two makes sense. But again, the problem I had, the problem is, is, dude, you know, this still comes down to the same problem, which is um, if it gets to here. And this is going to start returning from that point forward. And from that point forward, it won't matter. So, for example, if it detected, I mean, general, yeah, I mean, it's kind of interesting. And if it's not inserted, and it's not inserted, and it's not inserted, and then it is inserted. Okay, that's something. Um, that's one potential situation. Uh, but we want to be able to distinguish the first mount. That was the thing, so... Previously, previous stat was probably set much later, that would be my guess. Um, and it was maybe set differently, or what did I have here? Um, that's pretty much the same logic, I guess. There's no place where I threw in a like, uh, extra line saying, hey, uh, if this is the case, oh wait, here's one where stat equals false. It's equal zero. Yeah, which it does there. Hey. Let's take a look. So, yeah. All right, just take a look here, make sure I get all the changes covered. Uh, so the first thing it does is it adds this. So we'll stick that at the top. Oh, I see. Right, because it does get set later, so yeah, let's do this.
supposedly actually change. The idea of this status is that the first where uh, what was the first boot, first check. Um, You can see here when it's inserted, it does a check, safe delay, and then they check if they're mounted. So this could be longer, and that would probably solve the problem for many. Uh, but yeah, into the depths with managed media, do this little blob, which used to be spread around, but I tried to get it all in one place, uh, so if it has to be another flag, I guess there has to be another flag. But the problem I, the, 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 <laughs> the problem I have is just that um, Down here, if everything is done, it's the first mount. But it doesn't count if it's after 5,000. Mess, when you even used anyway? I see. See, I think I've been through this kind of thing before where it was like, oh, let's just waste four bytes to, you know, RAM to check and see if five seconds have passed. Uh, I know it's really stupid to worry about four bytes, but I do. <coughs> there's uh, there's a very limited amount, and we're hitting limits on certain builds. But I want to like you know keep it down on the minimum. You know, minimum size build should be as small as possible. You can avoid having to use another flag that checks for five seconds have passed, and another one has this even been initialized like. Why? Why is this all here? Um, the initial media check was done if the previous status is not 2. It's as simple as that. It should only be, you know, and then here, this media change, like the way that behaves, is based on the fact that this could be the same, but this could also be different with old stat being 2. So it behaves a little differently on the first mount, um, if it goes from 2 to 0, for example. 2 to 0 is like nothing, basically. Uh, 1 to 0 is, you know, something actually got unmounted and maybe something needs to say so, which is basically media change and just puts up a message. Okay, it does a couple other things, but yeah, it puts up a message, re-emits the LCD just in case, and does a refresh on it. Then it does a little MS check-in as well uh, to see if the, oh, it sets the uh, next LCD update a little later so it doesn't do an update right away. And then uh, resets the LED power off timeout. Okay, so good. Uh, either way, it does a bunch of things. And then this does its thing. Old status is less than two, right? So here again, looking at the logic that has been glommed in here, um, uh, right, so looking again at the logic that's been glommed here, as soon as it gets through here, it's automatically considers it to be done, like it's done the first media check. Um, and it doesn't even do the mounting stuff yet uh, to try and mount it. 
to determine that it has in fact like is the media inserted that things says so fine has the uh, card had time to get settled and you could do a whole thing with more flags and trying to make it more asynchronous and stuff but it gets messier so I don't know Anyway, to recap some of what I was talking about over on the uh, Twitch stream, I uh, just went over the uh, the fact that I've been going through, like, okay. Some things. So I'll switch over to this other branch. Let's get that out of the way. For your convenience, yeah, so I've got a uh, bunch of things ready to go that haven't been pushed yet because they make some config changes for the most part. Uh, and some are follow-ups uh, to those things. Um, maybe that follows there. I don't know. Rearrange them. Uh, either way, uh, these are... Uh, waiting for the pro UI updates which are in progress uh, not a whole lot but basically just uh, various cleanups to the pro UI which you if you're using an ender 3v2 with the pro UI previously called the uh, enhanced UI um, pro UI is more brandy good uh, so yeah, you'll be able to do more things with it, including a unified bed leveling, more unified bed leveling stuff. There, uh, excuse me, uh, while I uh, stretch here. Oh God. Uh, oh, somebody's talking about doing a Q and A in Michigan Tech. Well, it's not deter it's not confirmed, so I can't about that yet uh, but yeah I'd be interested in speaking to some students that'd be cool Q&A boy uh, when they hit me with the hard cue you know what do you do for insurance um, next question uh, so yeah some of these current position Z equals something buffer line with the homing feed rate these three lines almost look like uh, you could do um, a what's called a blocking move. Blocking move. Do blocking move two. But I don't know if I'd want to necessarily do that with uh, this kind of stuff. Anyway, uh, yeah. So these changes are coming in. Const auto. Selected y. Auto. Const auto. I guess auto is a good way to go now with C++. You might as well just use auto a lot more. Um, not sure why auto is chosen here. If anyone can enlighten me. Selected divided by something. So it's, yeah, it is what it is. I guess it just simplifies things. If you decide to change the type here, you don't have to worry about fixing them up later. Maybe there's some concept of like, uh, you know, if you needed a bigger thing like a, a 32 bits or something, it would automatically do that for you, like rather than throw an error. I mean, is that what auto's about? <laughs> Avoiding those errors getting thrown at you? Not necessarily. Um, Y'all. Go back to my notes for a second. Do a quickie. Let folks know on the Facebook that I'm live streaming it. Just for fun. I don't usually do Facebook ever, but might as well. Uh, I have the right date on it anyway. Good. 
I'm glad I filled it in yesterday because I would have forgotten to do it today. I made it on my photo. Look out for my photo, noise. Two PM Central. Can I edit? Oh yeah. CST. Boop. There, it's updated. Happy. There, I announced on my uh, Facebook that I'm on live. How about that? Where else should I go? Instagram? I don't really do Instagram. <gasps> but I have an Instagram, so I might as well try it. I've never really used it before. Much. There's save all my login info now on my computer, whatever that means. Uh, can I post something? Oh, I got likes and shares and loves. Someone liked my photo. Some female. I wonder if she's real, man. I'm gonna go with bar kills on this one. They're probably she's probably not real, man. So let's see what I can do. Can I post something? It looks like this means post. Oh, messages, that's what that means. Oh, okay, this means post, right? Yeah, create a new post. Select a photo. Okay. Uh, on Twitch, yo. I just upload that and then actually say I'm on YouTube on next filter put some weird filter on it next adjustments brightness contrast saturation oh yeah hit it temperature next Red caption. Share. See what that does. At least they, they're just going to scan it and make sure I'm not naked. Well, I guess I could be. It's Instagram. All right. Let's see where we're at. Oops. Hello. I don't ever use Instagram, so this will be interesting. <laughs> yep, it doesn't turn it into a link. You're going to have to copy and paste it yourself, folks. That's fun. Yeah, I'm going to be here for a while, so get used to me. Who else is up? Hello, Alisti. I know people are going to look at that and be like, hey man, that's Twitch. I'm be like, yeah, shh. It has a nice layout. It looks cool. I can, and it gave me like one big cool picture to post. I turned it in black and white as well. Pretty cool. All right, so boring, boring. Pro UI updates. Yes, once these are in, you'll have better Pro UI and you'll be able to click your screen all day. There's one change I made, which is just like trying to make the uh, menus prettier. Meanwhile, 2.1 is a little more. So you'll see there isn't much on top of 2.0 that makes it 2.1, but the main thing is the support for nine axes. That's the big one. And then I actually do change the version number there. And I do believe I have the uh, configs ready to go for that as well. It was a lot of work. Not a lot, but I mean, with what I with what I did with uh, the um, 209 stuff was pretty straightforward. I took everything I had in bug fix up to that point or whatever. Um, so we had import basically, and I just started pulling out the uh, commits that didn't apply. Actually, just taking them right out since it's going to be an import branch. It doesn't matter, um, and that made it a lot more straightforward. Although, if you pull out say um, some change earlier, like a long time ago, 
and then you and then later on there was a config added that had that in it you have to consider that so it's like oh, I can't just pull these out I also have to undo in later configs things that might have been you know, in there but the way I could do that is to you know back propagate them onto the commit it doesn't really matter I mean ultimately the end what you want is configs that match up with the whatever's in 2.0 x marlin so and then the same with the 2.1 once I've got it whatever's in there which basically is going to be everything I can get out of bug fix uh, in there and after this we're going to be moving on to a uh, 2.1 uh, thing so that means I guess I'm going to have to rename a bunch of things bug fix 2.0 x will remain but dev 2.1 x will be the new uh, target default target and uh, and then uh, yeah just calling it dev I guess is gonna change maybe the timbre a little bit but I don't think I'll be keeping a separate bug fix branch from the dev branch it just there it just simplifies things to have one target for pull requests and it also like when you try to merge histories it's it's uh, it's never fun especially and just generally in general when you can avoid doing a git merge between two branches that's always a nice thing it's just that i don't know when you're eventually going to do uh release notes which boy i look forward to that uh when i eventually do do the release notes which i should probably get into um for the 2.0 and 2.1 branches uh fortunately they will be 2.1 will be so much smaller um but yeah, once those two uh, things are, are are combined, once the release notes are ready, uh, yeah, be be there. Uh, where are we at here? Uh, right. Yeah. So I, was, I wanted to get back to the, my um, my little minor debugging project. Um, one of the things that I've been trying to do, and, and I've been doing this over on my Twitch streams a little bit, is um, looking at Pull it up on OBS here. One second. Uh, bring the camera over. Oh gosh. Make sure it's all turned on. I think it is. Make sure I don't tangle up any wires. Oh. Here we go. Oh. All right, we're getting there. We're getting there. Getting there. Let's see what we look. Let's see what it looks like. Get Stream Deck on here. Uh, there we go. Yeah, look, I get it centered pretty well. Hello. Um, so yeah, that's pretty good. So we got a, uh, we're all set up with, um, this is connected to my Ultra computer. Can't just say computer, it's an Ultra. Um, and uh, that's your ST link. See, I've got it wired up correctly. I have uh, pulled the cover off of this, you can do. With this thing and uh, checked the circuit board to make sure that the markings here actually mark match what's on the circuit board because sometimes they don't and it's okay so you can rely on this guide for these wires and uh, let me bring this up closer take a closer look you can see that there's a guide written on there very helpful guide totally out of focus but there it is if you ever want to check it out um, on your ST link. But uh, yeah, so I've hooked up the wires, in this case, blue, orange, green, yellow, over to the board in that general order. Blue, orange, green, blue, green, orange, yellow. Um, and connected it up to this port on this particular board. It's labeled SWC. It's not J-Link or something like that. That's a slightly different thing. Um, but and there's also, uh, yeah, there's different types of connectors, but uh, this one is mine. Uh, and this is a, this here is an SKR2 board. I'm not sure if it's the A or B variant, but it doesn't, it doesn't matter. I haven't been messing with stepper drivers so, and um, automatic detection or of, uh, reverse detection or anything like that. So. I haven't burned anything out yet, 
but I will double check before I use this board to make sure it's got the right things in all the right places. Um, over here I have my PSU, so uh, turn that on. That's important. All right, there we go, 12 volts. And there we go, power that up. And you see I've already got Marlin flashed on there. I killed the bootloader, so I'm flashing it at the start of the flash memory. Uh, I also have a USB cable ready to go for connecting the data. Oh, here it is. Uh, connecting up the data to this board um, so that I can talk to a serial console. And this is for flashing and for debugging, live debugging with GDB. So everything's all set up and ready to go. Um, now, to do a GDB session, I'll actually need to do a new, fresh compile. So I have a fresh ELF file, because I don't think I have the ELF that goes with this. I didn't save it. So what we typically do is we'll switch to Visual Studio Code, and I'm going to open up uh, Marlin firmware. And auto build. Um, meanwhile, we have. Did I pull up Discord? I guess it makes sense to pull up Discord as well. Hello. There it is. There it is on the other screen here. Uh, chatting with Rocks with ST Link. Uh, um cool gotcha oh new party mode what's party mode oh no discord party mode that's just insane i guess that's for me I don't know if everybody sees it. I guess it's just me. Oh, someone at Big Tree Tech wants to talk to me. I forgot about that. I was so asleep. Um, and yes, busy. Gotcha. All right, let's go uh, announce me live stream on the Marlin channel. I hate to announce to everybody. Marlin Live. Welcome to Marlin Live, private channel. Um, live stream. Hello and welcome to live stream, folks. That's right, I'm doing a live streaming on YouTube, so stop on over. <laughs> I don't know how long I'm going to be here. I'm pretty hungry and I got coffee, though. It'll late start today, uh, so it is what it is. Uh, but let's, let's do a little quick announcement live stream yeah okay let's post my live my same live stream message again i'll be live streaming happy saturday Oh my god, this party mode is too much. Yeah, I know. Let's let's tell all eighteen hundred people. I didn't catch up. All right, cool. You can play it right there in your inside of Discord. How about that? How about that? Oh, look, I got a few likes from manual, from random people who are probably, these are the bots. <laughs> Whoever reacted like right away, these are all going to be the bots. Oh, gosh. Who's that? Uh-huh. Angry Ping Sock. 
King. It's funny. But yeah, there you go. Hey, I, you're on my you're on my um <laughs> server, so sorry. I I'm not as bad as some folks like if you if you follow someone like uh like uh who have I got here? Uh, like the Creaky Blinder, for example. Oh my God! Like he puts up so much stuff, and every day I'm like, how many notifications? Oh, I better check those twenty notifications. It turns out it's all Creaky Blinder putting up videos. All right, let's do a quick update of Visual Studio Code. Oh man, coffee is running low. I may have to do a, I may have to do a split stream where I uh, stop and go myself and get more coffee and then come back um, anyway let's do our build for the simulation and not for the simulator but for debugging so um, I call this config uh, oh crap here it is where it is Marlin right I have a config and this is testbed skrv2 and uh, be all fixed up at this point. I think if I rebase it on bug fix, I'll be in a good place. Let's do that. Ooh, a little bit of a mess. Hold on. It's always something. Oh, okay, no big deal. Something changed there, I guess. Next. All right, we're good, all rebased. Um, and yeah, sure, why not push it? Oh, well, I don't necessarily want this playing around, I guess. USB ST link debug. Interesting. Without Cortex debug? Blah. Um, right. Right, so. For my purposes, whatever, this is my private branch, so I'm going to keep it. Uh, all right, so if we go back to VS Code, you should see it's ready to go. Uh, I could do any of these builds. I'm, I guess I'm going to try the debug build, the USB debug build, because it's just com most common. Um, as for how to debug this, um, I wrote up notes <laughs> last time. Uh, last time we were here, let's see, I think... That's just spurious messages. I think we'll get a good build if I do it again. Oh. Huh, this used to be zoomable. The single button, where'd that go? Interesting. Yeah, so there's my build. I did it silent because it's just Better to be silent sometimes. Let's see, okay. Yeah, that's a new option in Marlin, auto build. Just don't have to see as much, and it's much easier to see your, your error messages. Like if you, do a, if you do get a bad build or whatever and you wanna see what's going on more closely and you had this long string, string of build messages, you can just turn that on, do another build, and you're there. So yes, yeah, so the idea with this build is now that I've got it done, um, check my uh, debug info here. Right, no, not Marlin Simulator, Mac coding, yeah. Right. Okay, yeah, actually I do also have, that's right too, I forgot about this. Um, Launch.json, I think it's called. Yeah, somewhere here. There it is. Yay, I saved it. Okay. So this is the part I need right here. So previously, previously on this uh, channel, um, in Visual Studio Code, I installed the Cortex Debug plugin. Um, which uh, makes it a lot easier, apparently, to do debugging. Um, in previous attempts to do debugging straight up GDB, it was trickier. 
Um, this makes it a little easier because you go to your debug, you go to your add configuration option, which you may be familiar with if you've done this before. Uh, these I can get rid of. I mean, these are all just what I had originally, I guess. Not sure how these end up in here, but they're part of uh, Yeah, it's interesting. Where do these come from? Look them up. Um, anyhow, I'm going to add my my new one here. I'm going to get rid of all of these just to make things easier to see. So there's my little thing, and now this should show up under here. Uh, once I save it. There. Now it says debug STM32 ST link. And if I hit the run button, it should do all the right things. But uh, including, it'll launch um, our tool. Uh, it'll launch uh, OpenOCD. And it'll also launch uh, our instance of GDB as well. So I believe that I should just be able to say run. Oh, I also, I haven't built it onto the board yet. So the other thing is, yeah, also, where did I put it? It's, it is definitely the USB debug that I'm using, so that's good. Definitely the build I'm doing. Uh, sorry, I keep jumping back and forth. Okay, so let's do the de uh, debug, which will actually upload it. It will actually upload it. It won't just debug. Um, it's got a debug in the name, so upload turns into the words debug. So now it's just programming. Um, programming the board. Hurrah! It's exciting. Um, then when it's done, which should be pretty quick, it reboots. Yep, we're good to go. And now I should be able to just simply launch and go. So, uh, yeah. This will attach to the running firmware in place. I don't think it will reboot it. The other thing I can do also is I can run the monitor since so I'm connected by serial. It should find it. This particular board uh, with the firmware, the way it's set up, is not going to reboot. So now to debug, we just say, uh, let's pull up the debugger here. Hello. OK, so we did a build. Did it with the debug button, and that uploaded it to the board, which you saw earlier on the board getting uploaded. So now I can do M119, check this M114, you know, M115, these kinds of commands to just get some feedback. And you can see my terminal is all connected, ready to go. Uh, so I have that, and now I can actually run a debug session on it by running the debugger with the launch JSON stuff that I just put in here. So here's the launch JSON stuff that I put in. You might not have seen because I was probably had the wrong screen up. But now you can see it's got uh, some interesting things. You can say open OCD, workspace root, sort of some common stuff. This is a, it's a launch, blah, blah, blah. We're going to be using ST link. We're reading this ELF file, um, which actually I'll show you real quick. In terms of the auto build, we can go to where the build is. And you can see that it's got a bin file, and then it also produced an elf file for us, which is great. Uh, so now if I want to debug, I should just be able to hit, go over here to the debug button in the sidebar and hit run and debug. And now you'll see terminal has shown me using 4000, but it seems to have successfully connected. So what can you do now in here? Um, now that I've got a debugger running. Oop, unable to match requested speed. Oh, it might have failed. Let's take a look. Um, program stopped. Up, oh, rebooted. It's rebooting the board. That's interesting. Okay, maybe it's because I'm connected by the monitor. But we can do some things. So you see that it brings up this, uh, this little debugger interface, which you can move around somewhat freely in the window. Um, it sort of hangs around just below the tab area. 
Um, so it is running. Now we can do a pause. Yep, and it actually is right here. There we go. So now I can go to the code. I can stick a breakpoint in at, let's say, Marlin Core. I don't know. We'll just put one in right there since we're, we know we're going to come back. We know we're going to come back. We know we're Oh, you know what? It's strange. Somehow the microphone disappeared from my USB chain. Hold on. I'll turn on an extra mic just in case. But um, yeah, that's interesting. The uh... It's good, isn't it? It's much better. It's very, it was very clear. Unfortunately, yeah, it, it went off of the USB chain for some reason when I connected the ST link. So Is it wired or wireless? It's wired. Um, I, the uh, there it is. It's back. I just had to uh, remove and plug, plug, unplug it and plug it back in. How about that? <laughs> Welcome to the IT crowd. Yeah, so uh, we'll see what happens if I run the debugger again. It'll probably disconnect again. We'll see. But I can turn off the Brio mic now. Okay, there we go. Just, just want to come and say thank you for your hard work. Appreciate oh, it. hey, thanks for stopping in. Uh, it has been years. Oh my God. Oh, thanks for reminding See? me. <laughs> <laughs> so, it was six years now, yeah. That's all right. They fly by because it's so much fun. <clears throat> Well, thank you. Yeah, the microphone. For some reason, it disconnects. This is a thing. I'm, I'm using the same machine to do my debugging as I'm using for my streaming. And uh, yeah, the microphone, for some reason, just disappeared off the USB chain once I connected the ST link. And the Stream Deck is actually starting to act up, too, as well. It's bot, it's uh, it's doing this blinky thing, so I don't know. There, It's all crap. It's all crap. I'm using this uh, old... Um, like. Either is, it's macOS, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, macOS is generally fine. I've just got this hub I'm not and uh, I've got this USB 3 hub and I've got so many things on it. Apparently, all at once, it's just not liking it. I could probably disconnect this one because I'm not even using the, that particular Are you on a cable. new MacBook Pro or something? Uh, I just got a hold of an alt of a Mac Studio. Oh, I see. Uh, and I've uh, been taking advantage of that. Well, like one of the cool things I can do is, uh, you know, because it's so powerful, um, I can be broadcasting and then also, you know, gaming at the same time on the same machine, uh, which, which is nice, you know. Um, <laughs> generally speaking, that can be fun. So I've been doing that a lot. Uh, not that I'm running anything very taxing. This isn't exactly Cyberpunk 2077. <laughs> but also, I don't have the audio capture on, so you know I have to like rely on the ambient microphone to capture it all. Oh, I know. I'm sort of still hooked on on <laughs> on the older games because they're. They're simpler. They're more elemental. Um, 
I admire their purity. <laughs> So that's a fun one. Uh, let's see. So let's see if I can figure out what this debugging is, issue is. So you may encounter this yourself. What's that? People still play quite freely, Oh yeah, no doubt. I mean, I've, I've even got um, I've got World of Warcraft here. So, not World of Warcraft. Um, Warcraft Three, uh, which still connects to the Blizzard network apparently. Uh, yeah. And uh, I never, I haven't played it, but I pulled it up because I, I, you know, I have uh, Steam as we all do, and uh, there's a lot of games on Steam that that are so old they don't run on modern Mac OS, uh, even on Intel, yeah. because they're 32-bit apps. So everything the after, difference. yeah. The difference from Warcraft 3 was really fun. So yeah, had to get had to get something that could run 32-bit Intel stuff on. So. Uh, oh yeah. Basically, a machine that is capable of running Mavericks. Uh, yeah, you trying to view was it Mavericks? Yeah, Mavericks. Are you trying to view emulation stuff that they're doing? Oh yeah, for example, uh, Q QMU uh, is. I'm a real fan. Uh, like I have uh, a few QMU emulation setups ready to go. For example, here's. Uh, here we have Mac OS 9.2.2, uh, which is the latest, greatest. There's actually some patched version of this as well flying around, which I probably should use just because um, it's got a couple of improvements. It's not like it, you know, solves the problem of semi-cooperative, semi-preemptive multitasking, trying to work together, but... At least it, uh, uh, I'm able to find an NVRAM partition. It usually is fine even after that. What's your favorite new Marlin feature that you've seen come in? My favorite new what now? Marlin feature. Oh. Has been for you. Uh, in general, like, I, I'm hoping for, uh, like, just like overall improved motion smoothness you know like running on being basically easier to deal with <laughs> uh but yeah as far as features go um there's some new kinematics that i i wish i could talk more about that are looking interesting uh so you can have multiple heads all running on the same car uh, like sort of like um you know all running off in a simpler system yeah um so multi-carriage stuff is looking interesting um, I, I want to try and get it running on the duet boards, like I've got the the Maestro here, uh, and um, I've been just like slowly whittling my way towards that, but it's like it's not exactly the same PAL. Uh, but getting it working on this would be neat, because then I could, you know, get it running on the tool changer as well, which is a Wi-Fi, Duet Wi-Fi 2, Duet 2 Wi-Fi, so that's... Uh, you know, and then that would be starting to work on things like CAN bus and things like that would be possible. Yeah, CAN um, bus is, is a very popular thing. Right yeah, now. yeah, that would be cool. Um, that would be cool. Um, what, what's your take on um, input shaping? On uh, input shaping is well, it's a lot of calc it's a lot of extra stuff to add to the planner, so I can't actually get it into Marlin's planner without a rewrite right now. Um, so, but also but like, do you, do you do you want to see it in Marlin? Or? I mean, uh, if it can be done, would, you know. Also, it, it, in order to do it, it would rely. It would require some tweaking of the planner in ways that could be useful for future things like input shaping. I don't know if that would matter, uh, uh, but basically, I mean, it's a little extra calculation. Uh, you do have to do this tuning, and you need to do all that. And, and then, if you move your printer, it's, it makes a difference what surface it's on. Like actually. So if you move it, as uh, Chris showed on his Chris's basement recent video, like you can never use a shaky table, or you can use uh, like you know all kinds of things that, and uh, you're going to get different results based on just where you put your printer. So yeah. you have to retune it for each surface, and it's just not, it's another parameter that you have to deal with. Another, not necessarily another point of failure. Yeah, in a lot of it's, that might be hard to set. Um, well. 
I, I've been contemplating the ideas like, well, what if you, like, the idea is that you want to cancel resonance in some, in some manner. There are different ways to approach it. Like, we have S-curve, which at least does, it does more smooth breaking between, uh, as it turns corners. Uh, Do you want to Yeah, it's tricky. Uh, he says it's not as good as resonance conversation, and I, I kind of agree because after using, um, I'm sure, yeah. Yeah, you know, after using uh, the problem with uh, in, input shaping, mm -hmm. it does. Like I, I have compared to print quality, um, it does actually round off um, sharp details a little bit, especially when you're pushing it hard. Right. Um, however, the lack of um, ringing is very nice. Yeah, does it, uh, I, I've got to look at it more closely because I've, I've, I've noticed like when you do things like uh, linear advance or whatever, you'll get places where the motor runs backwards or whatever, <laughs> um, yeah. and uh, stuff which adds interesting dynamics and sounds to the print. With input shaping, I imagine it, it does have some subtle uh, effect on the sounds because you're reducing resonance, it must be quieter as well. Much quieter. Yeah, it's, um, but the the actual theory of input shaping is uh, is a little bit tricky. Uh, yeah, there's there's like different types of PL and rock, um, and each have their own characteristics. Like some do more smoothing, some uh, some cats will have two hump res um, resonances, some cats will have a single hump resonance. And each axis has their own characteristics. It's quite interesting. I think you should give it a shot. Um, you can get your hands on it. On the machine and yeah, the way I could sort of think of doing it would be maybe adding, I mean, this the way it's described here gives me a slight hint. It says it, it creates a commanding signal that cancels its own vibrations. So in essence, it would be another layer on this on the motion system, sort of after between where we're sending the pl the steps to the planner and like I mean you can do some calculation I guess in advance. You're looking at things like how quickly am I moving and when I stop, how when am I stopping? Then input shaping looks at okay, what resonance does that introduce? Uh, in other words, what frequency is it, is it going to be vibrating at once it stops, and how long does that resonance go on for? And uh, and then you know so it can pick all those things up and then use that information to cancel the resonances. Uh, one way you could do that. One way I can see doing it mechanically, of course, is you add a counterweight to your axis, so that's like essentially the same as the weight of the carriage. So anytime mm -hmm. that you introduce a ringing in one direction, you're introducing you're canceling in the other direction. That can do some yeah. reduction. Of course, you know putting it on a surface like. Uh, a carpet with a mat underneath seems to do some amazing things, uh, but yeah, once once you're looking at uh, when you got your leftover vibrations, what do you do to get rid of them? That's well known. There's, it's, uh, I guess, the, some of this stuff has been was originally done for other types of uh, control systems, uh, production lines. Yeah, cranes yeah. especially. That's one place that gets mentioned a lot. I have a PDF about it, and I was reading. I printed it out so that I could, you know, be sit down seriously and you know put on my reading glasses and really stare at it for a while, and hopefully it would get in there. Uh, the math is is interesting, but I think I really need to look at the actual implementations. And there's a there's a preliminary implementation in RepRap firmware, I guess. RF, yeah, it's not very good compared to control RFC. Yeah. Sort of trying to, it's sort of the same idea as trying to shunt it into there, when, whereas Clipper was probably designed more with, uh, well, they can rewrite the, the, the planner in Clipper all, the, all day long because it's got a different, yeah, exactly. a different it's, approach. What is elegant code as well? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of things we can do on board uh, with the faster processors and now. Sure. Uh, so it's just a matter of bringing some of those over. Uh, but yeah, there's even things that like linear advance one. There's a newer patches to linear advance that we still don't have that are in could, could Prusa firmware. It's horrible, by the way. It's time based, which is very silly. Yeah. Think, um, because like if you speed up the print, the value changes. If you change the speed, you should change the value, and that's kind of silly if you ask me. Yeah, some things shouldn't. 
I mean, things like your uh, max acceleration and things, I feel like, you know, you probably don't necessarily want to tie that to a single, you know, multiplier. Time metric and time, yeah. Uh, but, yeah, because you're going to get different dynamics. It would be nice, though. I mean, I would love to have a printer with 17 knobs that you can actually just physically turn. And, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and just, you know, till you get things dialed just right, uh, yeah. I would almost, uh, heck, I've got a drawer full of extra knobs. Maybe that's what I should do with them. Uh, just <laughs> turn them into inputs for, uh, for printers. But yeah, looking at the, the input shaping stuff in, as you look at the input shaping stuff in Clipper, uh, yeah, it's, it's, you know, you choose a frequency for the X mark, frequency for the Y yeah, mark. The ADXL chooses it for you, and then, like, I mean, if you look at the graph, it'll tell you, like, um, the pink runs on the inside. Oh, you just give it, I really suggest you give it a shot. Cause yeah. There's a lot, there's a lot there. It tells you the maximum speed, the maximum acceleration it recommends. Gives you like theoretical where it does over smoothing. So if yeah. you pass the speed, then you're going to get less quality results. If you stay below that speed, you get better quality results. So it, it tells you where you should set your slices and things too. Um, so if for infill, you can just ignore it and just go hard out. But for the outer perimeters, for example, you might want to respect the suggestions. Hmm. And and the the print speed is ridiculous, first of all. And secondly, um, yeah, it's just, it's just really it's just really fast and really smooth looking prints. Um, but I do I do still use Marvin and, and um I, I, I don't I don't ever plan on taking some of my clocks away from Marvin because it's just a just a, a better robust firmware. Well, and I like everything being Oh, that's true. I mean, it also it is kind of overkill in a sense for what it's doing. Um, yeah. You know, if you just want to have a display and you know, but in the meanwhile you've also got a, a network stack and a um, all, all these three D graphics stuff running in the background. Well, not, maybe not three D graphics, but yeah, the, the chip shortage is another thing. Like, uh, yeah, although it's funny with the chip shortage, the uh, the RP twenty forty has become somewhat more viable just because there's more of them lying around. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, it's not super viable because well, I have a for example the uh, Big Tree Tech board, but it really does need to have a Pi married to it because there's no way to attach a display to it. Uh, you just don't have enough uh, pins left over. Yeah. You could use a serial controller of some kind, uh, and it does have some other connectors that could be brought in. In fact, here it is. Uh, it's a, I mean, it's a beautiful board, uh, and it's tiny, uh, very tiny, the SKR Pico, um, and stuff, and it's got all kinds of beautiful connectors for your motors, uh, for everything else, your end stops and everything. But what's missing is just no no display connector, none, none yeah, whatsoever. Like physical displays are less desirable nowadays, and web UIs are quite nice. When I had a Fairfax firmware running on one of my printers, I just literally deleted the screen because it was useless, you know? <laughs> that, that board is beautiful, by the way. Well, uh, it seems sponsored and integrated. Yeah, I mean, it's well made. It's a beauty. Uh, I don't know what this uh, these funky uh, like covers they've been putting on things lately, but whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it looks cool. It's Fine, I guess. Oops, I'm dropping pieces of it though. I don't want to lose that screw. Well, I see where it's at. I'll get it later. <laughs> but yeah, that's the. Uh, apparently, it's held on with two screws. So there you go. Now I know. And one of them is in its washer or safely on the floor where they're not going to get any lower. They're not going to roll away. Yeah, so that debug session was interesting. I was wondering if uh, if it was this or maybe this that was causing my woes with the USB chain. So I'm going to disconnect them both and see what's up. But yeah, it looks like the stream deck may have come back to life after that. Hold on a second. I don't want to disconnect the wrong camera at the wrong time here. Okay. Bring the stream back back to life and see what happens. Oh, is the software not running? Yeah. Uh, 
Hey, thank you for hanging out. And uh, yeah, I'll, I'll keep uh, doing my best here to make it better and not break things. <laughs> um, yeah, well, uh, I'm still, yeah, I'm still clashing with all my uh, current secrets with Elias Marlin. They always come to me because of tech support. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, uh, uh, like, that's. Come in, I'm really happy. It's called it's the early days of Microsoft. The one thing that Microsoft did that was really amazing was it provided so many tech support jobs. Uh, so, you know, let's hear it for rep rap. Woo! <laughs> yeah. Well, this, this time it's a bit further away, so you need to, like, make him a bit more forgiving because he's in a cold place, but... Yeah. <laughs> but not too forgiving, he's gonna play that balancing act. Yeah, right, and the, especially if you're doing, like, ABS, forget it. Oh, not ABS, yeah. <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah. They definitely need to be like you know they have to have to a halide sprinkler system inside just to, just in case. Yeah. I got to put this back on because it'll break apart. Hold on. All right, we'll catch, catch you later. Thank you so much. Yeah. Cheers. See you next time. Bye bye. Bye. Hey. All right, see, so we've got some Discord chat. Unfortunately, I'm I'm not piping audio right now. Uh, I can figure all that kind of stuff out. Maybe there is an, a virtual source or something. Uh, that would be interesting. But let's just do a quick check. Virtual source, audio input, capture. Let's see. Create new. Um, I'll just say Discord, question mark. Okay. And unknown. Yeah, no, unfortunately there isn't one. So, nope, not none for you. Just just us. It's just me and me and a lapel mic. Um, so yeah, there may be a way I can pipe it, but uh, that's not super important. Uh, hey, I got it. I'm glad I checked. Uh, let's check the let's check the chat. But yeah, probably a few messages mentioning my audio issues. I think I'm back. We're all good for now. Again, I'm using the same USB chain, so I have to be careful what I put on it, apparently. Uh, but for the moment, it's working. We're good. Uh, how's Marlon treating me lately? Hey, pretty good. Freddy, Freddy I'm doing all right. Um, it's been, uh, you know, I'm kind of just continuing on, you know, continuing on. I got through, uh, the main thing that's good about is uh, I got through the, the, the issue queue, the number of notifications was piling up, and we ran these bots that locked all these old issues, and that filled up my notifications for a while, but yeah, they were easy to find and, and get rid of, so now I'm down to only a couple hundred, <laughs> but I'm only participating in less than a hundred things right now, so at any given time, it's nice. It's less less distracting, less worry. I don't see a thousand things in my face that I'm thinking, oh, i got to deal with all of these. They're mostly now settled, and things that are actually feature requests that are staying open are still staying open. But, yeah, we closed up on so much stuff. That was nice. Uh, so that's that's the part. Uh, Frederick Hemner, love the versatility Marlin. After 3D printers and two CNCs, I'm running on a woodworking finger joint jig for my table saw. Hey, why not? Um, and I'm building a film processing developing machine based on it. Nice shit. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing is uh, so many things you can do with it. And now that it has like nine axes or whatever, um, plus E, whatever, you can just go crazy and rotate and do linear motion, whatever, to your heart's content. So yeah, the number of things you can build with it. And then just basically tweaking the screen you know, I mean, we kind of made it just to be a big platform for experimenting. Um, the Some of the stuff that's easiest to mess with is like the menus and, and things like that. And then setting up axes is fairly straightforward, although it would be nice to have like a axis wizard or something. I mean, in the future, what I'd like to see it would be like a more general system where you just have, um, how many steppers do you have? Okay, just tell me where they are. And then we'll figure out some way to assign them. But like it's tricky when you want to do it in a static way, which has kind of been our major hurdle with Marlin is everything is static. 
and compile time, you know. So if you want to do that, you have to have very, you have to very sort of carefully figure out ahead of time how you're going to do it. And then whatever we do in the long run is going to have to accommodate all the stuff that's in the dynamic steppers and all that that's in there now, all the indirection um, involving different types of uh, extruders. And so anything that got built from the ground up, uh, you know, it would be tricky. So we try to do things in place and that that's a challenge. So yeah, um, it, it has, uh, it has its, its value being what it is like monolithic build, build and go. But yeah, there's certainly some things that are currently hard coded that could be uh, slowly moved over to configurable. Little things like, um, you know, your end stop positions are are changeable with M two hundred six, but they're not at the at the hardware level in a sense like changeable. They change the workspace in a sense offset. They're not meant to. They're meant to be uh, invisible to that. Um, I don't know. When it comes to things like hot your hot end offsets, there's things like that which, which are software hardware, but it becomes complicated when you start to make things variable. So, but you know, there are things here and there where you could say like, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, safe homing. Maybe sometimes you want to be able to turn that on and off. I don't know. Things like that could be done that are currently, you know, hard coded, but it's a little tricky to do that in general. The way that it's set up, we have a lot of, uh, you know, uh, compiler directives with if on them, and then I've got these macros. Turn macro is actually an if. If this is set, then emit this code. Otherwise, just completely ignore this, so it it won't see. Hey, settings doesn't exist. Um, it'll just never say see it. So the compiler is like, you know, being uh, protected. From things that it doesn't need to see, <laughs> uh, but yeah, there's a whole uh, there's whole aspects to the way that Marlin is done that make it challenging to um, to reframe and to add new things. Like we just had this discussion about input shaping, and that's you know the kind of feature you'd love to have, and to get it in there, uh, you would basically need to either modify, I would say generally speaking, modify the planner at some level. Like we have blocks and they're all just linear and they just go. And there's, uh, you have acceleration in the block or you have deceleration in that block and it's always linear or it could be curved. So we, we have a way of dealing with that where we have like a, it's linear but it's, but it's then curvified, curvified linear. So Anyway, the general idea is that it changes the frequency of the of the motion. Um, but anyway, so imagine we're still using linear motion. Uh, how does input shaping modify the acceleration deceleration? And what do we have as far as like, is there anything more complicated going on? Like in audio, you have attack, sustain, release, um, decay, release, attack, sustain, decay, ASDR. Uh, so you have your attack in which, you know, the volume is increasing or something like that. So maybe you have it come up slowly. Uh, and then you have uh, yeah, the decay, which is the initial, um, or the yeah, attack sus sustained. So it'll sustain. So there is some decay after the initial attack. Boom. But then it'll sustain, sustain at a certain level for a while. So it keeps a certain amount of energy. Uh, vibrating, but then it'll decay over time, and then there's a release, uh, sustain, and then release. The final release is like, where does it go at the end? When the note ends, how does it end? Is it damped? Is it cut off suddenly? Um, does it follow a natural decay? You know, that goes on for essentially forever. Uh, you know, what do you got? So there's different ways of dealing with um, these parameters, and you can imagine, since you're dealing with resonances that those things, attack, sustain, decay, release, all they come into play in a certain way, you could say, with motion, because we're talking about vibration and resonance, and certain resonances that come up. And so, yeah, how do you deal with those? The theory, again, we were just looking at the, the web page about the theory um, and about some of the implementation um, and how it's uh, measured as well, using like an accelerometer 
measuring resonances is the next section you can see. Built in support for an accelerometer. So we'd have to do something like that in Marlin, um, get that information. It uses uh, SPI. Um, so you just have to get the information over SPI, mount it somewhere. Um, and yeah, then you have to deal with, you know, uh, X, Y, making sure it's oriented correctly. It's, it's not, it's not a trivial thing to do. So it, it's kind of why, you know, and again, also where do you hook up a Marlin? You know, it's not like we have a lot of free SPI ports on a Marlin board, which is already loaded up with all the other things. But if you could find the, the spare pins and use them, uh, you could imagine also doing this, the measurement using uh, your Raspberry Pi, but then applying it to Marlin. But if you have a Pi, then you're probably thinking more about Clipper anyway. Um, you can see there's an awful lot of information about it here. It's written up very well, I'm sure. Um, but yeah, the resonance compensation is fascinating stuff, really fascinating. Um, and. What I'd like to know is really kind of I'd like to understand more at a level like uh, show me under a microscope and in slow motion what is going on as it's actually moving and printing like give me a high speed camera and, and a microphone <laughs> a microscope and like let's take a look and see what's really happening there and get me introduced to the, the concept of okay now what does input shaper do that's different uh, I mean essentially it's changing the speeds uh, at which things happen but it may also change the uh, like it's square corner velocity so that's what we're looking at it rounds off corners and so one of the things is that you, it is going to have an effect on the way that your model comes out so i've actually been contemplating whether input shaping alone is the most sensible way to get rid of ringing or if there are ways that you could mitigate it using for example uh, some clever use of um, going backward, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like once you end, instead of just ending a line, quickly do a reverse, or or at the end of at the end of a motion, do something that that causes the resonance to undershoot, overshoot, like go into a realm of uh, where it doesn't. Uh, do this. <laughs> I'm just trying to figure out ways of getting rid of that. What we've been seeing is like the like when Chris did his video, he showed ghosting, especially in the y axis, implying that you know something about the x is causing the vibration in that direction. So as the bed is going backward and forward, there's some something going sideways more. So things are going sideways, as it were, with his printer. Uh, more than anything else, and that would imply to me that the X carriage itself on and the belt and its mounting is probably involved. Like if it's on a uh, if it's on a linear rail, you would expect to see vibration where the belt vibrates because it's kind of springy. Uh, but if you're on um, a couple of uh, rods, maybe you have uh, some a little bit of binding, and so it's actually got. Like on my printer, like if once it stops, it stops. There's no vibration. Like it just moves on my Prusa because the the bearings that I'm using are actually um, bushings and they're PLA and they grab onto the rods a little bit. And the rods themselves aren't exactly perfectly parallel. They're very close, but uh, so a little bit of torque on there, uh, a little bit of uh, I should say uh, friction enough. Anytime the carriage moves, it has to be pulled a bit, and then when it stops, it just stops on a dime. So it's, uh, you know, it, one thing you could imagine there is backlash, where it takes a second for the belt switching direction to start pulling the carriage, and so that's the one thing I could see. Now, once you start introducing things like backlash compensation and so forth, like, you know, at what level do you introduce those things in the whole flow of coordinates going through and being turned into steps that are sent off. Um, so yeah, it, the simpler that this can be approached, the better. Like here we have the velocity of outer perimeters, six oscillations, 100 millimeters per second. We assume that it reached that velocity. So you can come up with 49.4 Hertz vibration. So that's interesting. So yeah, you can actually 
do this kind of thing. You can measure without using an accelerometer. That's kind of neat. Uh, and then the printer has cell resonance frequencies. That's a possibility, it says. Um, ringing frequency can depend on the position of the model. Yeah, so, you know, as we look at the planner, like, if I just collapse it all down, <laughs> um, the one thing we're doing is populate block, um, populate a block, and then we actually um, add a block. So there's a place where, uh, where is it? Get current block, blah, 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 forward pass. Is it populate block, buffer steps? I would say buffer steps. Might be the place where it buffers block. Um, yeah, it gets the next free block, populates the block, um, and then recalculates. Um, it does some stuff for the first move. So yeah, there's some complicated stuff going on in the motion system just to get the blocks set up. Buffering a synchronization block, which just synchronizes the position at the right time. Um, because you don't want to be writing to your, uh, you know, stepper positions inside of G-code while the planner is going. You have to do have it do it itself. So yeah, buffer a segment. So here we have a segment getting buffered, creating the block. So you know, at this point, we've got we've committed. You know, a segment's getting committed, and uh, it's going to get run as part of the whole thing. And again, every segment has. I start at this speed and I go to this speed and there's so acceleration is all pre-calculated in the blocks themselves and then that those values are used throughout the um, if there is a difference in start and end speed like those things will be adjusted as the thing is stepping um, in real time and if they are the same then they're just continuously moving that line and there will be nothing so you can imagine whatever we do to get Input shaping in here is going to have to come somewhere before buffer segment or in that general vicinity. We're going to have to look at the trapezoidal stuff that we do. Um, like if you look at the word trapezoid, it comes up um, in a lot of places. But yeah, here's calculoid. calculate trapezoid for block. So we have a couple of speeds, entry speed, exit speed. And it just calculates some, some things like the initial rate and the final rate. And it does that in terms of steps per something, something. Uh, there's also laser stuff, which happens we can ignore. Um, so you can imagine, again, if you're using a laser uh, and you want to avoid ringing on your laser, uh, you know, you may have to worry about some of the speeds and things coming in and affecting the power of your laser as well. Um, but all of these things, as long as they're done in the right place in the whole flow, uh, that can be mitigated. You know, we can mitigate this stuff. So yeah, the theory on um, if we go back to our browser, yeah, the theory on this stuff is pretty cool. And then the question is, where do the? How do we then introduce or change those uh, those frequencies, and what do we do to get rid of them? Um, apparently. Uh, yeah, there's something called Max Excel. So yeah, basically you end up tuning your accelerations. Also, you end up again with these rounded corners. Like we kind of have something like that where the corners get a little rounded from junction deviation. Um, like one of the things you can imagine is like if you have a corner, it simply goes like this and then like this. What you want to do is you want to have it be rounded, but have really really teensy teensy segments. But you can imagine like. Um, if you want to have it do a calculate properly and notice that you're stop, coming to nearly a stop and cha changing your angle by 90 degrees, if you have tiny segments, each one only changing like by 10 degrees or something, and you can only do look ahead of say, we'll say five or 10 segments or something, you'll only see that, oh, you're just making a, you're making a leisurely turn of you know this many degrees um, and so we don't have to slow down for that that's not a problem so it'll just hit that corner and it'll just keep going at full speed and never slow down because it never gets the impression that it's, cha it's changing uh, angle at a high amount 
So what you want to do is have the accelerate the deceleration around corners be mitigated based on the fact that you are changing by say C you're changing by 10 degrees um, but over nine steps so you're changing 90 degrees you want those 10 degree slowdowns to amount to essentially a full stop by the time you get those nine steps so you're slowing down by for your 10 degree you know your one tenth of 90 degrees or whatever uh, you would slow down by 10 percent presumably so that that's the theory um, but you know and then so for any uh, anything that looks like so you change basically you slow down by some percentage of 90 degrees uh, if you were or if it's a full stop you would essentially be reversing so yeah there are cases where it's a full stop and there is no turn you're just stopping and reversing or you know maybe you're stopping and you're doing a little bit of a move and then you're reversing but typically like you can't just um, assume on any on any level that you're doing certain motion that applies always to 3d printing there'll be cases when it just wants to go back and forth and you could just run that and see what happens um, and that may be one good way to uh, to mitigate things is just run your printer back and forth and you know you'll see certain vibrations of course the way the the resonance testing works in clipper it does all kinds of interesting moves and vibrations at very small scales and does measurements in the accelerometer and returns a very comprehensive set of results based on different ranges of frequency and motion and speed and then it can it could theoretically apply those but um yeah so you can see the actual gap in the print widens um yeah, and then there's a small gap in the wall to check the smoothing. So yeah, there's some cool stuff going on with this. Like you could use all the tests in that are applied in Clipper for red, for input shaping, uh, and essentially just play around with your accelerations, which are adjustable in real time, by the way, on your on your uh, printer. Um, so as long as you're doing like small segmented moves or whatever, like you can imagine doing some stuff where you run the printer back and forth while adjusting these parameters in real time and, and you know, while it's running a, uh, a G code or something that just does that for a while. They may do it, maybe. Um, and it'll just, you know, go back and forth, back and forth, and while it's doing it, you tune. And uh, at the end of it, you could have some kind of, you know, sense of how much vibration is being introduced just by, you know, having your hand on your printer, really, in a way. But we'd like we have accelerometers, so you know they can be super accurate. So yeah, as you can see, 40 and 50 hertz models show no ringing, and 60 hertz show more ringing. Stick with 50. So yeah, you can actually use models that are set up to do certain frequencies, um, assuming your you know stuff is set up right. Um, unreliable measurements of frequencies. Yeah, so if it's not stable. Um, you can try using input shaping, but it won't necessarily work great. Uh, so you can also add an empty input shaper uh, section. Yeah, fascinating. So yeah, I'm getting a nail clipper a little bit, but I haven't explored it and played with it and actually installed it and all of that kind of thing because that would be like a vacation for me. <laughs> um, but yeah, it'd be fun to do that. But yeah, there's the ringing tower STL. Suggested layer height, infill, one or two perimeters, sufficient high speed. Very comprehensive. I like it. So yeah, the folks working on Clipper are writing up some good documentation and um, are lucid. <laughs> They're very lucid. So very cool. It's good cool stuff. Yeah, on the Marlin side of things, yeah, we basically we just this last round uh, since the December release, I think it was December twenty fifth um, release, has been about fixing bugs, um, enhancing features, um, cleaning up stuff, doing some some refactoring. I've got a fan refactor that is just moving the fan code into a class and kind of cleaning that up. Um, and so, yeah, there's not, uh, there's a few cool new things coming in the 2.0, 
release is going to have uh, model predictive control, which is currently labeled as experimental, but it basically is uh, it models the hot end a little differently, and so you get it's different from PID tuning, uh, but it does have a tuning uh, that you can do, but yeah, it has a whole different set of parameters that you set, and you get a different. Uh, it should, generally speaking, it has less overshoot and quicker stabilization, which is all anybody really wants. Uh, if it could be completely dynamic and adjust to the um, hot end, in fact, if even the PID tuning we have could be completely dynamic um, and constantly readjusting itself, that would be nice. Um, it's tricky. It's tricky, I imagine. Um, but yeah, there's there's a number of things coming, and um, there'll be a stream. Well, I'm, I'm waiting right now again for the Pro UI updates, and then I'll do a stream where I go through all all of the uh, changes, probably as I do the release notes, um, and just give some general overview of all the changes that are happening since the last release. Which uh, if I go back through this history here. It has been a long time since December. Uh, trying to find the 2093 tag. Wow, yeah, there it is, December 25th. So since then, we have got, yeah, quite a few. Well, it'd be nice if it told me how many things I have selected. Maybe I'll add that later. Uh huh. So, yeah, while we have those, that's a lot. That's all the changes, but it's finite, so you know we'll get through it. Uh, but yeah, a lot of these changes are in the 2.0x branch already um, and pushed up because they're just bug fixes. They fix things, they improve things. Um, but it's all, all this stuff that hasn't been pushed up yet is things that introduce configuration changes, new options, um, and yeah. So you want to have all these be here. Is that right? Yeah, auto report redundant sensor. I believe I'm keeping that. Yes. Um, let's make sure I'm keeping that in my configs here. And then I did the same with the configurations. I have import branches for those, which have been carefully set up. This with only the only the uh, commits that matter for a two O. And then yeah, two one is I'm marking it two one because we added nine axes and other things. Model predictive control temperature is coming and. Yeah, all, uh, all these new things have been added, and I think the nine, basically the nine axis thing is one of the main big changes, and so I figured that was worth giving it a whole new number. Um, if I were to release two, the like the, everything as two O, I feel like it would be just too different in a way from the previous release. Um, releasing them sim close together is kind of funny, but. It implies that we've got a track to go forward with development on the two one stuff, and that it's more it's got more going on than just two point had so yeah, it's pretty pretty cool um yeah, there's so much going on uh <laughs> but yeah, I want to make sure I got only the things removed that I wanted to remove, yeah, okay. Good, that's still there. I was looking at uh, auto report redundant. I want to make sure that that was there. So yeah, that just adds the redundant temperature sensor to your temperature report, which, which really by rights it should be there, but maybe your host doesn't like it. So uh, it's, it has an R, I think, as its letter. So the redundant temperature sensor, I don't think a lot of people use it, but it's there if you need it. Like so much in Marlin, it's there if you need it. And you can rewrite it if you need to. Um, but yeah, it's basically just waiting on the Pro UI updates. There's a few other things. Um, if we take a quick look at the pull request list. Um, yeah, I was looking at removing the LCD serial port defaults. That's probably going to happen. Um, and some other minor things. The fan class stuff is not f too fancy, but it's not also not quite done. Uh, this is just, you know, this should have been done a while ago. Um, this kind of thing, just making sure that the fans are 
that's cleaning just clean up there uh, but yeah you can see here I've got right now thermal manager fan speed in an array uh, now it's going to be uh, the fans array and then the speed of the fan that you got out of the array so uh, this is you know just better C++ but also in a que uh, there's a question as to whether or not um, this actually makes for better code or you know putting things in classes in general rather than having separate arrays for them because very often you want to look at um, this thing in an array and then you want to look at the next thing in the array and the next thing in the array and um, one after the other and when you're doing object-oriented stuff you're going to be going not the next thing in the array and the next thing in the array well close together you're going to go to the next object and the next and then you go to the next object and so uh, they're not as efficient for caching purposes on modern processors your objects are farther apart and so you're going to have more cache hits or cache misses or whatever um, as a result and so typically it's better to have data that you're going to be iterating through uh, in arrays that are grouped together instead of having objects that are big blobs with their own data inside so you can see that um, you know in terms of efficiency and stuff maybe the, com the code compiled that comes out of the compiler will be essentially not much different maybe it'll be a little different um, for example if you're you know reading through an array your values are going to be four bytes long anyway so it's not like you know you adding four is not necessarily less expensive than adding a hundred so you might as well just let the uh, objects be objects and the distances between them aren't that big a deal. It's only when it comes to cache hits and misses and so forth that it becomes a bigger deal. Um, but object-oriented programming is, you know, that's the approach it takes. You could imagine having some kind of option to like flatten objects so that, you know, they interleave and um, if you go to the next object you're just going a certain number of bytes ahead. But you can't just interleave objects that way because, you know, they're not, they won't work. <laughs> but you could imagine some cases where it'd be nice if, oh, can I get the speeds out as an array instead and have them be squished together instead of each one being in the object. Anyway, uh, it just ends up being neater to have the fans grouped together and then have everything in the fan because the fans need to do certain things. So you can see, here's what I've done. Uh, it's not like a majorly complicated class. I created, uh, well, this is the the CPP part of it, but see, uh, yeah, it's not too complicated, right? Um, what have I done? What have I done? Um, first, we have some macros that deal with knitting, either writing with uh, OD or not. I forget what OD is. I should know these things. Uh, then uh, we have, you know, all of these, and then we init the fan based on the different settings that the user set. And then we have like, uh, you know, PWM mask is either going to be all the bits or it's going to be just a certain number of bits. Um, and what else goes on here? Yeah, so this is all code that already exists, but I'm just embodying it now. And again, uh, these are just little bits of code that repeat for each fan. And so we're going to be using the repeat macro to emit them, and I believe, uh, if I get that right. Uh, and so it makes more sense. So in any case, yeah, we have pre-declare the fan class, and then the fan is, itself is actually going to have, we're going to have an array of fans. And so we need to refer to this array of fans in the fan class itself. So that's why it's declared ahead of the fan class. Um, so we know that we're going to have this, and later on we'll figure out how big it is. But yeah, the, uh, and you can see, uh, again, there's not much going on here. We have an init where we init the fan pin, um, and each fan has its own index, which uh, I, I wanted to avoid having to have an index on the fans. Like, I wanted to basically have the, the fan uh, has a pin associated with it. This is one of those areas where I got a little stuck. I think I went over this in one of my live streams on Twitch recently, uh, but I was looking at this, and you know, the the 
what I'd ideally like to have is that each fan knows its pin, but it doesn't have to go, it doesn't have to have it in RAM, and also, you know, uh, if you could have a const, the thing about our um, fast I.O. stuff is that it writes to the pins directly uh, as ports, doing direct port manipulation to get pins written, written, written and read. So the, uh, when you, if you want things to be fast, like if I want to say fan five, write this pin, uh, you know, turn on high, it should just emit the code that writes the pin. That's it, nothing else. There shouldn't be any need to look it up or anything like that. Um, so what I ended up doing was uh, trying to write a uh, template class where you pass the pin number and then that would end up emitting a thing and that didn't work uh, because what happens is you can't make an array of templated objects because they're not, you, you can try, like I made them a subclass of another object, but then when you go to like, you know, use the object, it has to be virtual. So I didn't want to create a virtual, a, a virtual table of contents, uh, because when you create an object that has a v, virtual table of contents, it just, it adds more overhead. There's yet another thing I didn't want to add, and it was like, I'm trying to avoid it. So all, all these things trying to avoid it, and in the end, I end up just sticking an index on it just so I can get it to work um, and have the class be, you know, functional. But I'm still trying to explore a way where I could have it be static and do the right thing. Like right now, you'll see I have for every fan, it looks up and says, is my index this? If so, you know, do this thing, soft PWM on me. And so... Uh, every fan has to check that and the idea was that this index since it never changes this should never change either uh, but um, I, it's going to <laughs> uh, so the idea was then okay well I'll make static versions of these uh, that do the that do what you have here and you pass in the index and that way you have just one instance where it checks where you call it and then you know it'll do the right thing so in essence like yeah i'm trusting that the compiler sees that index never changes and then only emits the one case but you can never be sure some external file could change it and so i have to figure out some way to assure the compiler that never changes but there i can't so again i'm just left sort of foundering looking for a way to get this fan writing behavior with each fan to be unique, but not to have to look up by index what it, you know, and I have this right here again. So anyway, what I tried to do is just take everything that was being done with fans and then body them in a single class. So that included the uh, kickstart behavior, which I still haven't got right. The speed, of course, you need that. And the percentage speed conversion. The um, init of the pins of all the fans, the init of the one fan, um, the init of, uh, let's see, yeah, turning a, see, the, these things, which are the soft PW of logic, broken up into three different stages um, because they happen at different places, and then just having that logic be somehow embodied in the fan. So, yeah, all this stuff. And soft PW, maybe that becomes a class of its own. Uh, attached to a pin, which could be a fan or not a fan, um, but then you get, again, it's tricky. The more you generalize, the more that you have to deal with, oh, I have to have RAM. I have to have, uh, you know, this variable index here that I don't want to have. Um, but there is a reason why I think uh, maybe the fans need to know their own index so they can do other things later. I can't remember why. Like if you just pass the fan object some off somewhere and said, hey, fan object, do this thing, uh, and maybe you would need to know what its index was. So I don't know. But then uh, the case light, the whatever, the controller um, fan for cooling the controller board is completely separate from this, uh, even though it has some of the same stuff. Um, but yeah, it's kept separate. Um, 
so yeah, the, all this is all the code that got moved. So this used to be in Planner, which is like, why do you have fan code in Planner, right? Shouldn't it be somewhere else? So yeah, it's partly why I wanted to do this in the first place. Just like get the get the bloody code where it belongs. Like like here's all the things inside of Planner for dealing with uh, the fan speeds. Here we have uh, Stepper is also doing some things. So I ended up doing it this way, six speeds using Yep, fan. I don't like to do it much, but it's short. Um, temperature again also used to have all this fan code in it. Now it's been reduced um, to calling things mostly. Mostly. Um, and there's a few just cosmetic changes. Uh, but yeah, six speeds again um, based on the fan speed. Uh, six speeds. Uh, again, here's. If your speed is greater than this, do this. Maybe this should be, let's see, work PID. Uh, yeah, whatever this is for. So again, this is all just next MS2. Yeah, so some of these things, it was not like that was squared, uh, <laughs> which is typically what we put a two on things for. Um, but yeah, all this stuff you can see it ends up being a little more concise if it's moved into a fan class. And then, again, if I'm using repeat, because we don't know how many fans we're gonna end up with in the long run. So, rather have a repeat, and then later on, if I change fan, number of fan, fan count to 10, I'll get, I don't have to go over all this code and add eight, nine, 10. There may be some places where I still need to, but yeah, again, this is like <sighs> ongoing since the early days of Marlin, since the very first days, is just cleaning up stuff like often my own stuff. I know, but basically refactoring it in ways that make more sense, um, and bringing up making a class that embodies fans just does make sense, um, even if it's doing it's trying to do double duty, um, taking care of PWM, soft PWM, at the same time. But I mean, soft PWM is important. Um, but yeah, they stay, and then yeah, apparently I still have conflicts that need resolving, so let's fix that up real quick while we're here. That's why we're here. 24092 uh, is my fan stuff, so let's rebase it here. So I have a little quick script that'll just do the right thing for me. And again, Hopefully something simple. Okay, good. Planner. So what happened was created a fan class and got this. Oops. So that got set there now in fans.h. Based on does have fan and does have synchronous. So yeah, so that's gone. I don't need to define it anymore. Um, yeah, so the only other trick part now is all oh, right, I don't have to define this either. Okay, I think I'm good. Just had to do that. Rebase. Okay. Very good. So yeah, this stuff is just clean up. Um, which I guess I could push early. That's something I do. Um, if I can clean stuff up, Pass it off early, then I'll do that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, some of this is just totally unnecessary. <laughs> Honestly. But yeah, these things you can see, the reason I wanted to do this was just uh even though these work just fine, the I want the compiler like I guess IntelliSense or whatever it's called, the automatic 
code detection it just it wants I want to be able to see this as a normal kind of thing so that's what I did there um, you'll notice enabled is everywhere it's one of those macros that has taken over but um, and disabled and so forth uh, rather than if def and if and def they just there are reasons for that but essentially it's like if you want to do set this to false uh, forcibly when it normally it would be set as a default or whatever um, you could do that and it would register as disabled even though it's defined so you don't want to necessarily say if def you want to check if it's false too uh, same here watch chamber you know but if it has no value then we just assume it's true even though it wouldn't evaluate as true normally so I have to go through this whole process with enabled or disabled of checking whether this is true false etc and that's been whittled down with a clever some macro magic uh, into a turn macro and into macros like if disabled um, but um, yeah it's basically just for being able to mask off code to not be compiled as part of the build and yeah a lot of this stuff is important we have an elapsed macro and that's important because um, time can wrap around even though it takes days or months or weeks or whatever um, we still want to be able to check and see oh did the time elapse um, <clears throat> and so we use a subtraction instead of a comparison here and so that's just you know rather than make everybody that writes code relating to the milliseconds figure remember to do it as a subtraction I just have a macro for that so there's you know there are, re there are sort of way smart reasons for some macros being in this code even though people often hate macros I give a lot of crap to macros um, it's metaprogramming essentially but Marlin was originally built on metaprogramming so it kind of just ran with it I don't know if you've ever taken a look at macros itself but some of the fun stuff that's in there um, like why do we have all these things to find you know um, as you start to look into it it starts to make sense but like things like enabled for example they rely on this do pile here which you can see they've got numbers on them and that's part of the key it's like okay they call this one calls do 40 calls do does do one but then calls do 39 what the heck is going on there um, and what's it being passed and why does it work um, you know and so there's some tricks there but this is basically just to allow you to have something be repeated many times but with a different slightly different thing uh, you can see each of these eats three arguments and then passes on the rest eats three passes on the rest eats three eats W C and A passes on the V so A gets sent here W and C get sent there and V gets passed on to the next one yeah tricky stuff but all of this and then why is there this one plus this one why do you have to have that um, you know do n passing n somewhere yeah I mean it's all it all makes sense because it was all built sort of organically <laughs> but in the long run like what is do used for do does some cool things it takes a number of arguments that you pass in as V um, and it invokes a macro with an underscore on it front and then followed by this followed by a bunch of numbers um, with all the arguments that you passed in eventually and then you know you just have to supply the one the number one one so it knows what to do at the end and then that produces uh, and this is our enabled so enabled is you would know, you think it would be something simple hey just you know tell me if this value is set with no value or set to false or set to true or set to one or set to zero all those things are valid even zero x one is considered a valid like true all the things that are true and then you know those are then used in clever ways so you can see here that all these weird little is enable macros are just a tilde plus a comma plus a one like what's that about and why is there a comma in there what does that do and that's some magic it calls this thing called is probe which uses uh, which picks out the third argument of something that you pass in and so yeah it gets a little tricky but basically if I pass in something that 
and then you know you can see it's doing this is and nay it's getting concatenated together and glommed into a symbol that it can read um, and then there's a knot which reverses things like yeah all this voodoo is necessary because the way macros work is it's all through substitution um, literal substitution and so when you do literal substitution but then pass it through to the next macro thing to evaluate if there's a comma in there it'll be like oh you that's two arguments that's not one even though it started out as one now it's two as it gets passed on it's now two and so you can use these tricks to do various things and pretty much everything i'm showing is like how you have to do it um because of the way the system is but it's like yeah really strange um but yeah concatenating things together is fun you just join them up um this is used a lot um these are used so then yeah counting how many are enabled using plus using amp and and so yeah all these things are important um the cases where or comes up later like any pin see so yeah, all these take leverage the ones above and yeah they're really it gets really weird but you know i practiced and played with these for like many days and in a separate file compiling trying things seeing what works there was one thing there's a macro called map that i really want to write which is basically um, take all the things that are passed in and then use them in something that is then also passed in like give me the name of a macro to pass all the rest of these things to that macro or whatever and then it'll invoke the macro if you have five things in the list it'll invoke it five times with each of those things in the list so you could have you know instead of just doing currently i have repeat which will pass in like zero through five or whatever if you repeat six times but you know and then you can use that in your substitutions uh, for doing some magic things but uh if you wanted to pass in like five six three seven twenty two and those were you know or you know cat dog melon man woman camera <laughs> tv uh you could have those all be passed in and then used but unfortunately i never was able to get that map macro to work but yeah a lot of the same kind of stuff you can see we've got these lists I and mean, all these things are just there just just to first pollute the the namespace of but really just to create all these things that can be utilized throughout marlin in different clever ways to shorten elements of the code or make it possible to have variable numbers of elements emitted um, in various ways very clever stuff no marks no marks comes up and is used repeatedly for various things um, yeah just all kinds of weird stuff call if exists uh, strange stuff compile time strings were added at a certain point um, it's almost like I have those in a separate file um, but yeah like all this stuff comes into play and is used throughout Marlin 4 many tricks but yeah and then there's map never did work it's there and, and I tried I tried but it may work better now I've done some things, but uh, right now it's like not so good. Like I think I don't know. Maybe someone can help me out with these because like everything else works great. The repeat stuff, even though I've had to do, like you can see, repeat is very contrived. Like it does so much weird stuff. Like it has to have a repeat that takes in no arguments, but then evaluates to repeat which is the name of this macro up here. So when you say, hey, I want, you know, this to be evaluated, it'll return that. You can see here, this defer is used, which means it's not gonna evaluate it, it's gonna evaluate this later. Once, once it gets set up against these parentheses, it'll get evaluated, but this gets deferred for a period of time. The deferral thing don't even get me started this whole thing about um macro things getting painted blue and so forth like has the thing been expanded has the macro argument been expanded yet will it continue to be expanded and so forth um you know like 
the, these trick, there are all kinds of weird uh, aspects to macros, but essentially, yeah, the way that things get expanded is funky. So, yeah, I mean, there's not necessarily getting rid of a lot of this stuff. Like, I think about using template classes a lot for things like your fans um, and so forth, but the template classes, they come with limitations. Um, using just anything that's going to involve uh, using RAM, I'm trying to avoid. Uh, in general, and you know, more RAM, essentially. Like the fan code that I created is actually isn't isn't is only a tiny bit bigger than the previous fan code, which I can accept. But and it, and it uses I think four bytes more of RAM or something f for the tests I was doing, where I think it might have had one or two fans. So not too bad, but yeah, I'd like to have it be. Um, you know, ideally not have to look up in an index, like, what, what is my fan number, and then call its code based on the fan number. It's just silly. Um, so, you know, like, the, the one thing that is, uh, well, yeah, it's just, it's unfortunate. I really, I really wanted to have it emit each of those functions uniquely and then have it evaluate them as just plain old, you know, right to this pin, but now it's it's not. So, yeah, I'm still trying to figure that out. One way I thought to do it would be each pin just has a pointer to the right function that it's going to use, but and then it creates like an, uh, an auto, like, lambda or something like that, and uses the lambda that I... Yeah, that just started to get silly too. It was like, no, that's not it either. I can't just use a lambda. To, I mean, again, it's like C++ tries so hard to do so much. And it's like, I know if I was using the standard template library, there'd be all these other things at my disposal. But again, the STL is more about data structures. And again, it's about RAM. And there are things that it does that are great that can maybe work around a lot of the stuff. So it might be worth exploring like well what if i can use stl like how much overhead does it add is it even available on avr arduino like i feel like it's probably not um and if it was it would still add more overhead um things like using the string class you know like what kind of overhead does that kind of add versus convenience um and you know, we, we have to be not too worried i mean i'm not too worried about performance on certain levels like we can have some code be slower as long as it's um, not bigger because like it doesn't matter much um, as long as you're keeping up with with the keeping the planner populated keeping those blocks going like and keeping the stepper going it's pretty happy but yeah it's uh, it gets real tricky so yeah the earlier I was pulling up um, the debugger so I'll treat you to some of that since we're on YouTube now. Um, let me switch over to the desk here. Here we are. I had better light before so you could actually see the screen. Um, I'll try this now and see if this helps. Uh, well, it's a bit better. May have to do some more finagling. I mean, I could just point it straight down, I suppose, but. It's getting, uh, oh, I don't want to put it in the, right in the camera lens. Hold on. What if I point it down? Let's see. Like this. How does that work? This light is not very diffuse, so. Oh, yeah, that's what, that kind of blows it out. Uh, maybe a bit much? What do you think? Yeah, I think I'm going to just go with this. You don't need to necessarily see, see what's on the screen. Just know that you, as long as you can see that it's doing something, that it's functioning. So, yeah, my problem earlier was whenever I tried to do anything with the USB bus, my stream deck would go a little crazy. And my uh, um, so I'm, what I'm going to do is not get on this. I'm not going to connect by USB. Um, but I will connect, I'll still connect this DST link. So, 
let's see if the lapel mic stays alive here. That was the main thing. Gotta keep the lapel mic alive. Okay, good. Microphone's alive. We're good. Um, so we can we can still debug this thing. So let's get the uh, get the old debugger back up. All right. So again, let's get my build platform here. I'm using config testbed. Blah blah blah. Okay. And it looks like I'm going to have to do another upload just to be sure. Just to be sure. So let's do that. I have to do a face desk view now. Let's see. Uploading. I have the monitor running. Let's call. Let's kill that. And a GDB server as well. Kill all those things. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, when I did the debug before in LaunchJSON. Yeah, you can see I've got three things in there now. Um, I will pull up LaunchJSON here. And we'll just pull this out. This is the latest, latest and greatest in my testing um, to get the debugger working. Quickly go over these. So here we are at, in the um, debugger. This is under, if you click the little gear next to the debugger here, this brings up launch JSON, which is a file you can edit, but it will get overwritten later. So I am putting in a configuration for debugging. In this case, I'm going to be using ST-Link with the OpenOCD, and I'm going to be using um, Cortex Debug is the type of debug, and that's because I have the Cortex Debug plugin uh, or extension. That's uh, that's a name I can use when I have that extension installed. Otherwise, I can't use that name. So when that's installed, you can use that. I'm going to be connecting through OpenOCD um, to the board over ST-Link. Um, my current working directory is going to be workspace root. Um, I'm going to be not showing dev debug output. Um, I guess I could say parsed. Print results after parsing both. So yeah, so I could say use debug the extension. Yeah, so I don't necessarily need that. Config files. Um, so when you're using OpenOCD, this is uh, these dash f files are picked up, and these are going to be picked up from the right places. You just have to give them the right names. And this is you know, I'm using this particular type of board in this case. That's why that's STM32F4. And of course, we're using ST-Link and our executable ELF from our build. That's what you need is the ELF. Um, so if I show you the uh, folder it's in, you can see there's a an ELF and there's even an IDE data file, which is thrown in there for some reason. Um, but yeah, there's an ELF file, and that ELF file contains the debug symbol information that the debugger needs to help debug. Um, and then when I you not launch OpenOCD, it's going to do these things, which are, this is kind of optional, but I included it anyway. And then you have to have a pointer to an SVD file. So I just found the one inside of my platform I install um, called STM32F40X.SVD which I think is correct. And that's just, uh, I forget what an SVD file is, but you need it. Uh, so once this is in there, I can save it. And you'll see this menu changed up here. To debug STM32. And now if I press 
run or start should go through this whole process here of starting up the debugger, which it did. And I can see I've got GDB server is running here. And oh, it caused the boot to the board to reboot. I'm not really sure why at this point. Um, unable to match the requested speed using 1800. I'm not sure what whether it's a speed thing or something else. I've had success with debugging in the previous times, but you can see it actually did hit my breakpoint, which is great. Um, so I don't know if that means I can continue to step. Yeah, apparently it is running. So maybe what it did is actually reboot it on purpose. I think it restarted because I wanted it to. Um, anyway, it's now in the boot screen, which uh, you can sort of see here. If you look up close, there you can see it's in the boot screen. Um, and then if we go back to the desk, you can see that we are, yeah, stepping ahead. So I, I can now look at these files and these values. Here's flag, check it out. Um, card.flag, yep, here's all the flags. Here's Marlin State, currently MF running. There's where that is in memory. 801C2F8. Yeah, the debugger is up, up and running and working. So yeah, I can step over this. I can do all this kind of stuff. I can continue running. Um, every time it's the breakpoint, you can see my breakpoints are listed over here in the margin. I can turn that breakpoint off, but keep it. If I press run, it should continue on. Yep. And now it's running. The screen's got things blinking. So it's all good. Um, and yeah, if I decide that I want to debug something, I can do that. So for example, let's say that I want to check the logic of, oops, I turned my breakpoint on. <laughs> Turn it off, please. Let's put it there, but uncheck it. So yeah. So let's say I want to check the logic of G28. Suppose it's simple enough, right? Um, I should try, I want to try connecting up the the console so I can send a command, but uh, yeah, I guess I, I can do it from the screen. That, that'll help. Okay, so that'll be fine. So let's go to G28. CPP. We'll go to the G28 function. There we are. Um, and I'll just uh, put my breakpoint right at the top, I guess. And I guess the first line that it has is there. So there. So now I have a breakpoint set in G28. So now we can go. GDB is being a little slow. It says JTAG status contains invalid mode value. So that's interesting. It may be that I have to turn off a flag in the pins file for JTAG or whatever. Let's take a look and see. I'm using the uh, SKR2. Um, version 2.0. So here's the common things. Uses DAG jumpers. Mm, USB flash drive support. Take a look at the SKR2, uh, SKR2. There's two different revisions and Rev A and Rev B. Rev A, you got to disable driver, driver safe power protect. Meanwhile, revision B. Let's see, I guess I don't see anything related to the JTAG being affected, but I get the sense that something I'm doing with the, you know, clearly something I'm doing with the encoder is causing an issue. That's an interesting one. So let's ignore that for now. Let's just do our 
auto home. Boom. Now, it has paused at G28. So yeah, there we go. Um, let's see where the where the current breakpoint is. Well, it supposedly is here. Um, like you can see, it is paused. Let's do a step. Uh huh. I'm not sure where it's at. I did a step over. Up. Oh, it has come back to. It's here now. That's strange. Let's see what's going on there. Start time zero. Axis is minus one, so no axis. Interesting. Manual move task. It's full. Interesting. Okay, so we do eventually end up here, so maybe it's part of scene test that happened. Not exactly sure. But yeah, you can see I'm here now. Okay, so we're all good. Um, right, there should home. Okay. So yeah, you can see I'm going through, boom, checking my logic. And I ended up here. Did a step over, did a step in, and ended up here. Um, because that's the next next effective line, I guess. Uh, yeah, so I can just keep doing that. Synchronize, boom, boom. Set bed leveling enabled, false. So I could check my logic here, for example, uh, when I do my bed leveling enabled stuff before and after. So yeah, there's some interesting things I can do for checking that. Um, here I've got a workspace plane. Don't think that's going to do anything. Reset the stepper timeout. Boom. Check the whole ind tool index. Do a tool change. So I'll step over that. Yep. So it's doing all the things that you know it would ordinarily do. Turning on end stops. Boom. So I can follow this like completely and make sure that everything is what it should be as it's doing it. Um, so if I got a bug report and someone said. Oh, here's my log, and it shows these weird numbers. What's going on with that? Uh, I could easily go back and check. Hey, these uh, these numbers don't make sense. Let's see, need I doesn't exist. So you notice how it's like these are highlighted and these aren't. Like it's actually pretty smart. It's actually evaluating these correctly. See, got the Z correctly, but it didn't. There's no I J K. Same here. Although, that one you would think would be lit up. But yeah, they can't always do it just right. It doesn't know what I'm doing here. It does not know what I'm doing. Like, this is not, I mean, this phrase doesn't mean anything in C. So it's like, it doesn't know what to make of it. It's trying to do things like, uh, as if everything is well formed. But when you have uh, macros, things get really funky really quick. Um, it does its best to try and evaluate the code that gets emitted, but so yeah. That's part of the problem is like if I go to evaluate things I am gonna have difficulties just because um, yep. So it's doing scene test on all these things. You can see halted, halted, halted. Boom. Yeah you know, each line is actually, you know, checking. It's halting on each line as it does it. Fascinating the way the debugger works. But yeah, you can see all this is happening. Um, parser scene val r. At some point, I'll come to a place where it gets an, it hits an idle loop and the screen will actually update, which will be kind of cool. Uh, maybe. <laughs> so here we are, continuing on, doing Z clearance. Okay. So I just did a move of Z even though you don't get to see it. Home X, uh, do X or do Y. And if we're going to do like an end stop check right now, of course I have no real end stops on the board. So 
I could do simulation and stuff like that. I could put it into Marlin dev mode and make sure that all the things like homing and stuff are simulated. But sometimes, like, if I really want to see stepper signals and run a connect up an oscilloscope, you know, obviously I can't do that. Then you need to run in real mode. But so far, it hasn't run an idle loop or anything. So now it's doing home Z safely. This is a whole move. Do the probe. Okay, now it's done. Now it's doing probe move after move Z after homing. So how are we doing? Did it fail? Sync plan position. End stops not homing. Restore feed rate and scaling. Tool change back to the old tool. Do a refresh of the UI. It's not doing. Port the current position. And we're done. That comes out of G28. Which comes out of the display code, the process parse command code. Comes out of process parse command. Yeah, so you can follow the flow like of the whole thing as it's doing it. Now, I don't know how this would work with a real with an RTOS. You would probably have somewhat slightly more difficulty, or if there were multi multiple threads, of course, it gets trickier, but in general, like this because it's just running at a big loop. And then of course there's the interrupts. So if I were to put a breakpoint like in an interrupt, that gets that would get weird. I'm not sure what we'd even see at that point. We might get what we want, because I mean it is halting the, the whole board. But you know, it's it's tricky. I'll try it. I'll try and see what happens. That'll be fun. Welcome Lucky Cat. What's up? Um, just doing a little live streaming on the YouTube moment. <laughs> Let's see, and testing this debugging. Event handler, okay, so then it goes through the event handler and serial event run. So yeah, now we're way in the framework at this point. So let's carry on with running and we should see the screen update at some point, assuming everything's going good. Um, should be running up oh, there it goes. Yeah, finally it's updating the screen again. So there you go. So can debug all kinds of ways. Now it's a question of what kinds of bugs can we solve? Um, you know, there's a many in my list, believe me, um, that I could explore. But at the moment, what I'm going to do is explore my food options. <laughs> Order some food. So let's do that. Um, because I'm hungry and I'm lazy. I made uh, all kinds of good stuff yesterday. Um, but what I really need is soup with fiber and, you know, like, like they have a good Vietnamese place that sells pho over here. And that stuff is just like, mm, so good. But I'm kind of addicted to these veggie burgers, so I can get one of those. And yeah, cut it in half and add grilled onions. That'd be good. This is Arlo's. They're a, they're a food truck that sells um, vegan food, vegan burgers. And I'll give them a, I like to give them 18%. Oh, nice. I remember that I was logged in. That's good because it's a hassle to do the whole login thing. Cool. My food will be ready at 7.07. .07. So t typically that means 7.02 because they're pretty quick. So I'm going to hit them up. But yeah, we're doing an amazing job these days. Uh, look at this. Hitting the processors of the Apple M1 Ultra at 3.57 gigahertz. With 20 physical cores. Only three of the cores are doing much of anything. And then these two um, Efficiency cores over here are doing something. Uh, the main task is OBS taking up an entire core pretty much by itself. Um, but yeah, pretty pretty cool. I gotta say, and generally, um, I'm liking this as a setup for doing both streaming and coding at the same time. 
if I could just deal with the fact that my mic got disconnected when I tried to do um, USB serial to the board simultaneous to having the um, serial connected, the same serial. Uh, oops, I don't know if it's because I'm moving this around or what, but yeah, it seems to have some issue with the ST link, so I might just have to, you know, just make those connections better. Um, see if it's running or what. It was not halted. Hmm, it's looking like I might have disconnected. It's hard to tell. Let's do a pause and see. No, no, it's definitely still still on a debug session. It's just giving me a JTAG failure. Let's clear this. Go run. Yes. Okay, it's running. Pause. Yeah, see, I get this JTAG failure, which is weird. So yeah, I think it's a combination of something to do with this. Maybe there's a pin overlap with the screen. It's a possibility. But yeah, uh, that when I connected the serial console, I got the stream deck started acting up and the microphone disconnected. So it's like, yeah, it's a USB three hub um, with lots of plugs. Um, but I don't know, just like certain, apparently certain devices. And maybe it's this one being connected twice on the chain is problematic. I don't know. But anyway, uh, thanks for dropping by for this little session. I'm gonna. I'll get more into uh, the, I'm going to do a, a live stream either on Twitch or here uh, pretty soon uh, for once, once that pro UI stuff gets tested, I'll go over all the release notes, um, just give you an idea of what's going in tomorrow and for this next version and where we're at. And we'll take a look at the outstanding bugs list uh, after that, because I'd, I'd like to do the release uh, soon even though there are some bugs that are outstanding, like with things like layer shift and sudden quit, or, you know, print quits in the after hours and suddenly stopped. Those are usually issues of hardware with the GD processors, so I'm not diving into that just yet. I don't actually have GD to play with right now. I, might, I do actually have one GD board here. Um, that's a Big Tree Tech GD board, and it's, it's a rarity because there's not, it's never going to be released, but at least I can use it to test the GD processor and see what's going on uh, in play, play around with that and just see what the differences are. Um, but yeah, so I'm, I'll do a, some sense of what's going on with the new release. Um, and we'll just look at the outstanding bugs that are there and maybe we'll do some debugging at that time. Uh, in the meantime, I do have, uh, the, the new release will come out and we'll deal with whatever outstanding bugs exist at that time and we'll get a lot of a lot of new activity on the issue queue I'm sure <laughs> surrounding the new release as there usually is uh, so anyway uh, until then uh, it's been great to have you around my virtual babies uh, we'll see you again soon and uh, uh, yeah more more nerdism to come ciao I will not be able to reconnect to my stream.